Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. Susan, I cannot believe this, gasped Janet, her eyes widening in shock. Why aren't you asking Tim about this trip? Do you really think he'll be okay with it? Won't he be upset, especially considering you'll be the only married woman with a bunch of singles? You know Carol and Peggy, they'll probably start fornicating with someone the moment we land in Vegas. Asked Tim, seriously? Like he'd ever say no? Susan snapped back, her frustration evident. I'm fed up with Mr. Goody Two Shoes. It's not like I'm planning to cheat on him. I just need a break. My life is so dull. There's no excitement anymore. Janet, a longtime friend, shook her head in disbelief. Sue, be careful. I don't want to see your marriage fall apart because of a trip. Marriage, Susan scoffed. What Tim and I have is far from passionate. We've been together for over 22 years, and I've never seen him truly passionate about anything. It's like living with Mr. Whitebread. What's wrong with you, Sue? I thought you loved him. Why so bitter? Tim is the nicest man I know, Janet exclaimed. Susan sighed heavily. I do love him, but I'm tired of living with Mr. Perfect. He never gets upset, avoids conflicts, and won't stand up for himself. It's like he lets people walk all over him. Remember the New Year's Eve party? Walt Hurley was picking a fight with Tim, calling him a coward. Tim just walked away. He should have stood up for himself, but he didn't. I started wondering if he really is a coward. Janet saw Susan's distress and reached out to comfort her. Talk to him, Sue. Try to make him more assertive. I've tried, January. A thousand times. He just believes violence doesn't solve anything. I get so angry with him. That's why I need to get away for a while, Susan said, forcing a smile. Besides, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? Janet forced a smile back but couldn't shake off a sense of unease for her friend's emotional state. Tim Burns was undeniably a nice guy. Standing at a little over 6 feet 4 inches and weighing around 260 pounds, he maintained his trim and fit physique through early morning runs and regular workouts. His journey into adulthood began with joining the U.S. Navy straight out of high school due to financial constraints. Serving in the Navy for four years paved the way for him to realize his dream, admission to university. Upon being admitted, Tim pursued a major in finance and accounting, driven by a serious commitment to his studies. Despite being older than his classmates, he approached his education with determination, eschewing frolicking and carousing. His Navy experience was behind him, and he focused on achieving the best possible grades. In the early days of his junior year, Tim's life took a turn when he met Susan Sims. Introduced by a friend in the student cafeteria, the three of them shared lunches, and Tim found himself both comfortable and intrigued by Susan. Standing at five feet six inches tall, Susan was a captivating figure with short, dark hair and blue eyes that sparkled with excitement. After Susan gave Tim her telephone number, he called her, leading to casual dates at first. Both seemed to be navigating the uncertain waters of a burgeoning relationship, but it didn't take long for them to become an item. One evening, after dinner and driving back to the dorms, Tim steered the car into a local park and turned off the engine. Turning to Susan, Tim began in a halting manner, Sue, look, I want to talk to you. Just talk, Tim. She replied with a question in her eyes. Oh, yeah. Look, we've been dating a few months now, and I want. Uh, need. Yes, need to tell you how I feel. Sue just sat and waited, a twinkle in her eyes. Ah, uh, this is not easy, damn it, Tim muttered, unsure of himself. Sue, I love you, and I want to marry you, he blurted out, turning red in the face. Tim, how do you know? murmured Sue. We've never done more than kiss and hold hands. How do you know that you love me? Tim looked at her with a bit of surprise on his face. I respect you, Sue. I would never try to take advantage of you. Why would I treat you like a slut? He replied. Slut? Slut? She exclaimed. What makes you think that intimacy between two people who care for each other makes the woman a slut? Tim, I'm not sure that you love me. I think you want a girl who is like Mother Teresa, not one with blood in her veins. Sue sat back with a frustrated look on her face. Tim raised his hands in a gesture of self-defense. Wait, Sue, wait, he protested. That's not so. It's just that I've been in the Navy for four years, and the girls we came into contact with were not exactly college types. I just wanted to make sure that I treated you as you should be treated. He hesitated and spoke again softly. I do love you, Susan Sims. I want you to be my wife. I want to be with you for the rest of my life. Sue teared up and reached for him. Oh, Tim, I do love you. You're the sweetest, most considerate, and compassionate person I've ever met. Yes, I'll marry you. 
They kissed passionately and right there in the back seat made love. Sue graduated shortly with a degree in marketing and managed to get a position with a cosmetics firm in the area. She was to undergo a training period for a few months before she would be given a territory. She was quite surprised at the salary. It was quite generous. Tim still had a year to go for his degree, but they didn't want to wait and were married shortly after. They were able to get a small apartment near the university. Sue worked and Tim studied, and it seemed to work well. After graduation, Tim was also able to gain employment in the area as a junior accountant, and with both salaries, they had little financial concerns. When Susan became pregnant a year later, they decided that she would take maternity leave and then return to work after securing adequate daycare. Actually, Susan had decided. Tim went along with her. She delivered a daughter that they both doted on, especially due to the fact that there were complications in the delivery and Sue would not be able to have any additional children. They were both heartbroken, but were thankful for their daughter, Amanda. Both continued to do well in their professions and money was never a worry. With their combined income, they were able to eventually purchase a large home in a gated community with a golf course and country club. When Amanda reached her 12th birthday, Susan decided to stop working and devote her time to being a full-time mother. Tim quickly concurred. Tim also did well, and after over 20 years with the company, he occupied the position of senior account manager with a very comfortable salary. Then, a few weeks ago, a vice presidency became available and Tim applied for it. He was fairly confident for he knew that he was more than capable of filling the opening. A few days later, John Cook, CEO, called Tim into his office. Tim, good to see you. Please have a seat. Make yourself comfortable. Coffee? He inquired. No thanks, John. I'm fine, Tim answered, eyeing him closely. He felt that this wasn't going to be good news. Tim, let me be frank with you. I know that you applied for the VP spot. I have to be upfront with you. You're not going to get it despite the fact that you're smart and capable. Tim swallowed his anger. Okay, John. Continue with your frankness. Let me know why. Cook smiled gently. Tim, it's just that you're too decent a person. I don't think that anyone in this organization has ever worked with someone like you. You're extremely knowledgeable, considerate, very easy to work with and kind to everyone with whom you come into contact. You are very valuable to us because of the high admiration our clients have for you. That's one reason why we want you to remain in your present position. Tim pressed. What's the other reason, John? I think that I deserve hearing what that is. Cook nodded. Yes, you do. He leaned forward and looked at Tim closely. That's the problem, Tim. You're too nice. You don't have that killer instinct. You don't know when to go for the jugular. If there's one area in which you don't shine, it's in negotiations. Let's not kid ourselves. You know that I'm right. Tim nodded in return. He knew that Cook was correct. It wasn't that he didn't have that so-called ability. It was that he chose not to travel that road. He didn't want to go for any jugulars. He had had enough of that. He rose, shook Cook's hand, and left. He would have to tell Susan that the position was not his. She would not be surprised. She knew Tim. Tim sat at his desk, his gaze fixed on the view outside the window. In that moment, a rare introspection took hold of him, prompting him to reconsider the persona he had deliberately adopted after his discharge from the Navy. Years had passed since he made a conscious decision to mold himself into the person he had become. Tim had resolved to distance himself from violence in all its forms, whether physical or verbal. He even took care to eliminate any traces of aggression from his newfound personality. This transformation wasn't particularly challenging for Tim. Fundamentally, he was a genuinely kind person. However, beneath the surface, there lingered a dark side that he was determined never to let resurface. Now, however, he found himself questioning the extent to which he had embraced the other extreme of that persona. His mind drifted back to his years in the Navy, to the grueling training sessions during the dark hours on the cold, wet beaches at Coronado and underwater at San Clemente, places where nobody could hear you scream. The memories flooded back, reconnoitering an enemy beach from the surf line, silently taking down a moving vessel at sea, and lying in ambush for hours or days in the mud and stench of swamp land. The training had been thorough and he had become adept at eliminating threats quietly, whether with a knife, a garrote, or using various methods with his bare hands. For more than three and a half years, he served as a Navy SEAL, functioning as a well-honed killing machine. Iraq, Afghanistan, he was there. Darkness of the night was his realm. His hands never shake, no emotions and no remorse. His kill count was legendary. His brothers in arms were ready to kill and follow him to hell. As he approached the end of his enlistment, he felt the weight of the toll it had taken on him. 
Tim was aware that he was heading towards a breakdown and felt grateful when his enlistment finally concluded. He made a solemn vow never to let that dark and lethal side of him resurface again. But now he wondered, had he gone too far? He didn't know now if he fully agreed with John Cook. He didn't show the steel in his spine that a VP position required only because he chose not to adopt that characteristic. He knew that he climbed the last rung of the ladder at this firm. He would always remain in the position he now held. But, were there cracks appearing in that persona? He did not look forward to telling Sue about his discussion with Cook. He knew that the last few of years of their marriage were not exactly happy ones. Sue often seemed abrupt and snappish. She had adopted a habit of criticizing him and, at times, seemed almost contemptuous. He knew that he often had to control his temper and walk away from a possible confrontation. They seemed to have drifted apart. Tim's mind wandered back to the New Year's party when he had almost lost it. Hey, Timmy, slurred a half-drunk Walt Hurley. How's my bitch Timmy boy? Did you grow some balls yet? laughed Hurley from his height of six feet five inches. Tim had stood very still and just stared at Hurley while Susan just stood and kept her eyes on Tim. That's okay, Timmy, continued Hurley condescendingly. We know that you don't like getting hurt. He then laughed uproariously as Tim turned and walked away. The scene at home later that night was not pleasant. Susan couldn't wait to confront him. What the hell is wrong with you? She hissed. How can you let that ass make a fool of you? He made you look like some sort of wimp. Why didn't you defend yourself? What would you have me do, Sue? Tim asked wearily. Would it have been better if I had attacked him physically? Would a clever bit of repartee been more appropriate? He was sloshed, and I didn't want to make a scene. Let it go. Sue looked at him scornfully and snapped. So it's better that you look like a coward? Sometimes I wonder about you. She then turned and stalked out of the room. Neither slept well that night. Tim's thoughts lingered on the present situation. It went beyond that one night. Something was amiss in their marriage. Sue seemed consistently dismissive and the intimacy between them had dwindled to non-existence. Tim felt a growing disconnection, especially as Sue's disinterest was a turn-off. Who wanted to make love to someone seemingly uninterested? As Tim approached a crossroads in his life, confusion and apprehension clouded his mind. The carefully constructed facade he had built over the years now displayed cracks, leaving him uncertain about the way forward. Shaking his head, he temporarily pushed aside these worries. Later that evening, Tim shared his conversation with John Cook with Sue after dinner. Tim related his conversation with John Cook to Sue. She flipped her hand dismissively and just snapped at him that she was not surprised. Sue then casually mentioned that she and her friends were flying to Vegas for a long weekend, turning her attention back to a mundane TV show. Tim, taken aback, asked, What girls? Shouldn't we have discussed this before you committed? Sue impatiently replied, It's Jan, Carol, Peggy and me. We're going to have some fun. Don't make a big deal out of it. Persisting, Tim questioned, aren't they all single? Is this trip appropriate? Sue abruptly turned off the TV, snapped at him. Yes, it's entirely appropriate. I'll do what I want, and retreated to the bedroom. Feeling things spiraling out of control, Tim sighed. He sensed that things might get worse before any improvement, if at all. In the evening, Tim returned home and discovered Sue's suitcase, a reminder of her impending Vegas trip. Curiosity getting the better of him, he opened it and found new, provocative lingerie with tags from Victoria's Secret, items she hadn't purchased or worn in ages. Unbeknownst to Tim, the cracks in his persona were growing larger. Dinner's ready, Sue called, breaking the silence. Tim brought down the suitcase and eventually asked where she would be staying. Sue, seemingly caught off guard, replied, We'll be at the Rio, but don't call there. Just use my cell if you need to reach me. I'll have it on. Tim nodded, knowing what he needed to do. Tim woke up early on that Friday morning, quietly getting ready for work without disturbing Sue. He reached his office well before others, settling at his desk with a determined resolve. Enough messing around. Time to start calling in favors, he muttered to himself as he picked up the phone. Venetian, how can I direct your call? A female voice greeted. Ron Smith, please, Tim requested. I'm not sure if the chief is in yet. Would you like to leave a message? The voice replied. Try him anyway, Tim insisted. The phone was answered after just one ring. Smith, a deep voice responded. Hi Ron, this is Tim Burns. Tim spoke softly into the handset. A brief pause followed. Tim, it's been quite a few years. How the hell are you? I need a favor, Ron, Tim said, providing Smith with the details of his situation. I don't care what hotel she told you, Tim. We'll find them, and we'll keep you posted. They won't be able to take a piss without us knowing it. I'll be getting back to you periodically, Smith assured him. 
After a moment, Smith added, I'm sorry, Tim. You deserve better, and remember, anything you need, you just call me. Seals never forget. Tim expressed his gratitude, replaced the handset, and momentarily set the problem aside. Ron Smith, the chief of security for the Venetian, had strong connections with other hotel security heads in town. Tim had confidence that Ron would deliver on his promise. Tim had spent quite a few hours during the past week considering the course of action he contemplated. He had weighed the negatives and the potential for success. He had made voluminous notes and did spreadsheets. He saw little downside. He was more than confident, and he had made the decision to proceed. Reaching for the phone again, he punched in a long-distance number. Corallo, Simon, a female voice answered. Sam Corallo, please, Tim replied. I'll transfer you to his personal assistant. Hold on, please. Mr. Corallo's office, another female voice answered. Mr. Corallo, please. Tell him it's Tim Burns. I'm sorry. Mr. Corallo is not taking calls at the present. Can you tell me what this is in reference to? Honey, Tim replied softly. If Sam isn't on this line in two minutes, your job might just disappear. Just tell him that Tim Burns wants him, and do it now. There was silence on the line, and he heard the phone being placed on a hard surface. Tim didn't have to wait long. Tim, you son of a bitch, a hoarse voice bellowed. I should be mad as hell at you. You said you would keep in touch, and it's been, what, almost eight years since I saw you. I ought to slug you. How have you been? Tell me what's up with you. Jeez, Sam, settled down. I've been climbing the corporate ladder. I just never got as high as you, Tim chuckled. Tim, it's really good to hear from you. It's been too long. I mean it. We need to stay in touch. All of the guys do. We were a band of brothers. Tim heard the emotion in Sam's voice, and it choked him up a little. You're right, Sam. I think that we should take some steps to organize that. But first, I need a favor. It's money, Sam. I need some money. Shit, is that all? Tell me how much and where to send it. Sam roared into the phone. I don't know how much yet. And Tim outlined his plans to Sam Corallo. Okay, Tim. I'll establish a line of credit for a couple of million at my bank. You just draw upon it as needed. If that runs out, I'll put in another couple of million. Sam, we also need to discuss things like the interest rate and the repayment schedule. Tim insisted. There was a pause and then Sam exploded. You dumb shit. You insult me? Me? You stupid prick. Interest? Repayment? If you were here, I'd break your neck. Well, maybe not me, but I'd have one of my goons try, he chuckled. Tim laughed. Okay, Sam. Settle down. We'll discuss that later. I'm sure to see you in person within the next couple of months anyway. I'm serious, Tim. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't be here. I owe you everything. I told you a long time ago. Whatever you need, you have to call Sam. Please, Tim, remember that, Sam pleaded. Thanks, Sam. I know. Tim replied softly. They quickly concluded the details involved and ended the call with promises to meet soon. Tim looked at the clock and realized that much of the morning had passed. He pressed his intercom and asked Pam, his secretary, to come into his office. Hi, Pam. Please have a seat, Tim said as he looked at her closely. Pam was a nice-looking, 40-something-year-old, divorced mother of two. She had been working for Tim for over six years now, and he had more than a bit of respect for her abilities. Pam, do you remember when I first interviewed you for this job? Pam nodded and said, you thought I was overqualified because I had a master's in business management. From the Wharton School. I told you that I wanted a position that would give me the time to spend with my growing children and that money was not my primary objective. My ex was providing a nice sum in child support. Right? Tim replied. I have a proposition for you. Please relax and let me explain. Back in Vegas, Sue and Janet, looking a bit worn out and bleary-eyed, sat down for a late breakfast the next morning. Damn. January. I really drank too much last night. I feel awful now, Sue confessed, with a chuckle. But you know what? I think it did me some good. I might do it again tonight. We both had a bit too much fun, Jen chuckled. We're lucky some of the guys we danced with didn't push it further. Sue grinned. Maybe it wouldn't have been so bad, huh? Remember, what happens here stays here. Later that night, Jen found Sue waiting in the lounge. Sue, Jan began. I hope you won't be mad, but I met someone today and he asked me to dinner. I'm meeting him in the dining room in a few minutes. Good for you, January. That's great, Sue enthused. Don't worry about me. I'll grab a bite, have a few drinks, and then call it a night. Enjoy your dinner, Jan. I mean it. Jan grinned. Well, 
I have a few minutes, so I'll join you for a drink. Don't want him thinking I'm too eager. Suddenly a male voice boomed above them. Well, well, looky here. Two beautiful women sitting all alone. That's criminal. The girls looked up, startled. Sue replied, what the hell are you doing here, Walt? Where do you think I'd be, Susie? I'm a liquor salesman. I get to Vegas one weekend a month. That way I can take care of everyone here in one shot, and it leaves me the weekdays to service the local trade. But what are you gals doing here? Walt Hurley asked. Just a weekend away, Walt, Janet replied this time. Just a few days away for a break by ourselves. Jen bit her lip, immediately regretting giving him that information. By yourselves? I'm surprised, Susie. Timmy boy let you go to Vegas by yourself? I always thought he was a wimp, but I didn't think he was that stupid. Hurley laughed. Sue's lips tightened and she snapped back at him. Watch your mouth, Walt. I don't like you putting Tim down. Hurley was immediately apologetic. Damn, I'm sorry, Sue. Sometimes I'm too stupid for my own good. I really do apologize and I will apologize to Tim when we get back. You guys are good people. Sue smiled, pleased with Hurley's reaction to her anger. Maybe he wasn't quite the ass she had thought. Anyway, he was certainly good looking. Janet hesitated and looked at her watch. Sue saw her unease and quickly reassured her. You had better get going, Jan. Go have a good time. I'll be fine. Go. Jen arose and said, I'll see you in our room later, Sue. Okay. Sure. Don't worry. Have a good time, Sue smiled at her. They watched Jim walk swiftly across the lounge and into the large lobby. Hurley turned to Sue. Susie, please believe me. I really am sorry. Okay. Sue shook her head and smiled at him. Okay, Walt. But no more cracks. Do you understand? Absolutely. I will make sure that I'm on my best behavior. Now please accept my invitation for dinner. I hate eating alone and I'm sure you feel the same. There's a great little Chinese restaurant in the hotel and I would be tickled pink if you would be my guest. Sue hesitated a bit and then shrugged her shoulders. All right, Walt. Remember though, your best behavior. Sue was pleasantly surprised at how much she enjoyed Walt Hurley's company. He was attentive, complimented her, and made her laugh. Dinner ended too quickly, and Hurley suggested continuing the night in the lounge for drinks and dancing. Leaning over the table, Hurley took her hand. Sue, it's really early. Let's not end this now. How about we return to the lounge for a couple of drinks, and I'll show you what a great dancer I am. Real Broadway material, he joked. Sue giggled and nodded, finding Walt a blast and feeling strangely attracted to him. The next couple of hours passed pleasantly, and Sue found herself imbibing more than usual. Feeling buzzed, she knew she should refuse more liquor, but she was having fun, and Walt was a great dancer. Snuggling into him on the dance floor, Sue whispered, Is that a banana in your pocket? Or are you just glad to see me, Walt? She giggled uncontrollably. Gee, I'm sorry, Sue. I can't help it. You're so damn gorgeous and sexy. A guy would have to be a saint not to get hard dancing with you, he chuckled. Sue moved back into him. Oh, no you don't. I like that, Walt. You feel huge. She moved her crotch against his erection, feeling herself becoming more aroused. They continued dancing with Hurley's hands on her ass, rubbing and caressing. Sue had her hands behind his head and found herself kissing him passionately. Sue, whispered Hurley, let's go up to my room. It's quieter and more private. He led her out of the lounge and into the elevators. Sue staggered along the hallway with Hurley holding her up. Gee, Sue, I think that you're just a little tipsy. You're a real party animal, he leered. Sue giggled again, and they entered his room. Things escalated quickly as clothes were shed, and they engaged in intimate acts. Afterward, Sue, in a moment of clarity, realized the gravity of her actions and hurriedly left, leaving a gloating Hurley behind. Tim finished a hastily prepared dinner on Saturday night and settled into the den with a newspaper he had no intention of reading. It dawned on him that Sue hadn't bothered to call since her departure on Friday morning. A call to the Rio confirmed that there were no registered guests by the names of Sue or her friends. Tim wasn't surprised. As the emotion surged within him, Tim felt an alien, sickening emptiness. His marriage seemed to have reached a critical point, and he couldn't shake the feeling that it was over. The indifference and patronizing attitude Susan had developed over the years had eroded their connection. If she had indeed been unfaithful, the marriage might not survive, and a part of Tim would die with it. The phone's ringing interrupted his thoughts and he answered it, hearing Ron's voice on the other end. Ron confirmed Tim's suspicions, reporting that Susan had been involved with Walt Hurley, a known player in the area. 
Ron offered support and advised Tim not to do anything irrational. Tim couldn't immediately respond, emotions overwhelming him. The confirmation of Susan's infidelity and the involvement of Hurley were gut-wrenching revelations. Ron urged him to take time, fix himself a drink, and promised to keep the information safe. In a stunned stupor, Tim shuddered and held onto his chair's arms, tears streaming down his face. He felt a profound sense of sadness and desolation. The woman he loved had cruelly betrayed him, and he grappled with the pain. Anger replaced shock, focusing on Hurley. Vengeful thoughts crossed Tim's mind, contemplating Hurley's demise. Suddenly, he recognized the dangerous path he was on, his suppressed killer instincts resurfacing. Taking control, Tim reminded himself of the person he had become and refused to regress. As the reality of his shattered marriage sank in, Tim knew he had to make decisions. Accepting that the marriage was effectively over, he couldn't bear the thought of sleeping in the bed he had shared with Sue. He packed his belongings, made hotel reservations, and decided to face Susan when she returned. Susan and Janet shared the plane trip home in relative silence. Janet had exploded when she had discovered Susan's lapse of judgment, and they had quarreled bitterly. Janet finally turned to Sue as the plane was descending to land and gently took her hand. Look, Sue, let's not destroy our friendship. I will stand by you no matter what you decide. You do realize that the days ahead are not going to be pleasant. I know, Jan, Sue sighed heavily. Look, as I said before, I was drunk and so I made a mistake. I hate what I've done, but it happened and I have to accept that. What Tim doesn't know won't hurt him. It's not like I have much of a sex life with him anyway. Janet eyes narrowed. You're not going to tell him then? You know that I won't say anything. But what if he finds out sometime in the future? It could be even worse then. No, no, let's not start arguing again. Just think about it. They lapsed into an uneasy silence again. Janet retrieved her car after they deplaned and drove Sue home, and they parted with a hug and a kiss. Good luck, Sue, Jin whispered as Sue walked up her front walk with her suitcase. Sue shook her head and lifted her chin as she opened the door and walked into the house. She saw Tim seated in his easy chair. Hi, honey. Did you miss me? She smiled bravely. We had a blast, but it's good to be home. Tim just gazed at her coldly. Sit down. I want to hear all about your trip. What did you do that was such a blast? While he spoke softly, there was a force in his voice that Sue had not heard before. She quailed briefly, but gathered herself together quickly. I'm tired, Tim. I want to get into a shower and change into something more comfortable. I'll tell you all about the trip later. You're going nowhere. I told you to sit down. Now put your ass in that chair or I will get up and put you down. Tim threatened. Sue whirled on him. What the fuck is the matter with you? I just told you that I'm tired. We'll talk later and if you don't like that, then we won't talk at all. She blazed. Tim was on his feet in a second and was suddenly nose to nose with her. I have never laid a hand on you in anger, but if you don't sit, I will smack the shit out of your rear end till it looks like mashed potato, he snarled. He then placed a hand on her chest and slowly pushed her down into the chair. Taking a deep breath, Tim returned to his seat. Sue just sat and gaped at him. She didn't recognize the man before her. Tim had never acted in this manner. She decided to humor him. He was probably pissed that she had gone away with the girls. Okay, Susan, now tell me all about your trip and the blast that you had. For Pete's sake, Tim, Sue began. We just let our hair down. We drank a bit too much. We gambled and lost a little too much. Just things like that. We saw a few shows and had a few great meals. It was nothing terribly exciting, but it was nice getting away. Getting away from what, Susan? Tim asked gently. Getting away from me? It looks like getting away from me was your primary objective, wasn't it? Tim, Sue snapped. I don't what you're driving at. I'm tired and I don't want to play your silly games. And with that she started to rise. Sit the fuck down, Susan. We're not finished, not by a long shot. Tim snapped back at her. Tell me, Susan. How many men have you fucked behind my back? How many times have you cheated on me? How many times have you been unfaithful? I would really like to know. Sue sat, now white-faced, with fear in her heart. How much does he actually know, or is this his imagination talking, she thought to herself. She attacked, perhaps in a desperate attempt to deny what she had done. You're out of your mind, you bastard. How dare you accuse me of cheating or being unfaithful? Have you been drinking? What's gotten into you, you prick, she hissed. Tim suddenly smiled. You're not only an adulteress, but a liar as well and, I have to admit, a pretty good one. I imagine that you've had quite a bit of practice lying to me over the past few years. I know, Susan. I know all about your tryst with Hurley in Vegas. You're such a stupid bitch. 
You actually thought you could fuck him there and get away with it. How many times have you fucked him in the past, Susan? How many other men have you spread those legs for? Susan shook her head, stunned that she had been found out and shaken by her husband's confrontation. She silently berated herself for her foolishness, her stupidity. Tim paused, seemingly in thought. What I really don't understand is how I ever thought that I loved you. I guess that I did at one time, but the last couple of years convinced me that the woman I loved had vanished, replaced by a harridan and a slut. Well, now you can fuck Hurley again, Susan, as well as anyone else you wish. You won't have to worry about your husband finding out since you won't have a husband shortly. Susan sat, now trembling and ashen. She had never seen Tim like this. She had never seen him so angry, had never seen him so cold and biting. This was a new Tim that she now faced. Please, Tim, she pleaded. Please, at least listen to me. I screwed up. I made a mistake. I know that. But you can't just throw away our years together. I swear that this was the only time I was unfaithful. I didn't mean for it to happen. I swear, she implored, tears now escaping from her eyes. Tim eyed her with disgust evident on his face. It's not only your adultery with Hurley that convinced me to rid myself of you, although that was the deciding factor. You were disloyal, Susan, and you knew how important loyalty is to me. You betrayed everything that I believed in. Without loyalty and trust, no relationship can survive. Also, the past couple of years have been an ordeal. You've shown no respect for me and little consideration. I have been treated as if I were an unwanted guest, almost as a stranger that you tolerated. You know the real problem, Susan, Tim continued coldly. You began to confuse manliness with machismo. Your concept of what a man should be began to conflict with reality. I had told you countless times that a loud voice, a bragging tone and muscles were not the attributes that made a man a man. I also told you that violence was almost never the answer to a problem, but you considered me weak and timid. You had forgotten that a real man has no need to brag or put someone down. A real man has a sense of responsibility, a sense of obligation to his loved ones. A real man protects and provides for his family. A real man is true and loyal to his family and to his friends. A real man needs to be more than a large cock and a big mouth, but those seem to be the things that have attracted you. Susan sat stunned, in shock. She was literally speechless. Tim had never in their years together talked to her in such a manner, with such revulsion and bitterness. Tim, she pleaded. Shut up. Susan Tim snapped again. You really have nothing to say that I want to hear. Don't even try to lie to me again. That won't work anymore. I've already moved most of my stuff out. I'll make arrangements for the rest of my belongings. You recognize that there really isn't much of mine here. Almost everything we purchased during the past few years were things that you decided that we needed. I hope that those things will comfort you. I also suggest that you find an attorney. The divorce will go through quickly and smoothly if you don't decide to fight me on this. I will also provide for you so that your lifestyle won't change too much but I suspect that you'll need to find gainful employment. One caveat, Susan. You'll get to keep this house, but if I find that you've brought men here to screw, I'll stop all agreed upon alimony. I won't make mortgage payments on a place where you screw around. If you fight me on this, I'll just use the pictures I have of you and Hurley, so it's your decision. Tim rose and looked down upon her with a sense of sadness and regret. It's really a shame, Sue. We could have grown old together, and with that he turned and walked out of the house and out of her life. The next few months went by quickly for Tim. He had a business that he had to get powered up, and he thanked his lucky stars that he had Pam working alongside in her new capacity as Director of Human Resources. Her tireless efforts and her expertise helped immeasurably. It wasn't long before they had a core group on board and tentative interest being shown by many potential clients. The divorce went smoothly and, despite numerous attempts by Sue to contact him, attempts that he rebuffed, it only took a few months for it to become final. Tim had spoken to his daughter Amanda many times since the day he moved out. She kept reminding him that her mother was distraught and frantic to do anything that could lead to a reconciliation. Tim patiently explained to her that that was out of the question, until finally she gave up trying. Tim promised to keep in touch with her and did remember to call her every week. Tim was in his office when a messenger left a large brown envelope with Kim, his new secretary. Tim, you have a FedEx delivery from Doug Klein. Shall I bring it in? She asked through the intercom. Tim knew what it was, his attorney had phoned the day before. He felt a chill run through him and told Kim to bring it in. After she left, he sat and just looked at the envelope, not opening it, not touching it. It contained the final documents telling the world that he was now a single man, that he was no longer married. The marriage was now officially dissolved. 
He sat quietly and examined what he was feeling. This delivery dredged up some dramatic emotions, emotions that he thought he had put behind him. Sadness enveloped him. He felt an emptiness within. A hole had been left that he couldn't fill. He had also come to realize that Sue's alienation was, at least in part, due to his own unwillingness to confront her concerning the changes that were taking place. He should never have allowed that change in attitude. Never should have allowed the coolness that had soon characterized their relationship. Perhaps if he had been more forceful with her, the whole mess could have been avoided. But, in the end, it was her decision. She was a grown woman, and she knew the consequences of what she had done. Anyway, Tim reasoned, that was in the past, he now had to look to the future. What Tim didn't realize was that as he had received the final divorce papers, so had Sue. They were delivered through the mail from her attorney two days after Tim had received his copy. She had sat at the kitchen table and just looked at the envelope, not touching it or opening it. She knew what was contained therein. Her face sagged and tears again came to her eyes. She blinked them back and tried to compose herself. She still couldn't bring herself to accept the destruction of her marriage. She knew that she loved Tim and would always love him. She also recognized that it was her actions that had brought her to this state, but she couldn't think of anything that she could do that she hadn't tried. She had to think of something, anything. Tim had not forgotten Walter Hurley. One day, a couple of months after the final decree, he decided to begin frequenting the bar that Hurley occasionally visited. It was within walking distance of his office. He would stop by for a drink after work and was soon a recognized visitor. A few weeks went by and one early evening Tim could hear loud and raucous voices coming from the side room of the facility. He thought he recognized Hurley Bass, loud and arrogant. Hell, I've been banging half a dozen married broads the last few months. They're all whores, when it comes right down to it, he laughed. He had his coterie with him, and they encouraged him and laughed with him. Tim had moved over to the entrance of the room and looked in. Hurley immediately saw and recognized Tim. He leered with glee. Well, well. Looky here. How's it going, Timmy? Susie finally kicked your ass out, did she? Guess you couldn't measure up after me, could you? He laughed obscenely. What makes you think that any woman would want a piece of shit like you, Walt? A dildo would be a better bet. I understand that you can't even get your little weenie up half the time, Tim said slowly and deliberately, keeping his eyes glued to his prey. Why, you little prick. I'll teach you to respect your betters, Walt roared and came after Tim. What happened was almost too quick for the eye to follow but Hurley suddenly found himself propelled back into a table which collapsed under his weight. He pulled himself up, now with fire and hatred in his eyes. He had an empty beer bottle in his hand and murder in his heart. You motherfucker, I'll kill you for that, Hurley muttered. No one noticed the small smile on Tim's lips as Hurley charged. Again, just seconds later Hurley was on the floor, and a later medical examination would find that he had a fractured spine, a broken pelvis, a ruptured spleen, and significant damage to his testicles. A call to 911 produced an ambulance as well as the police. It was soon determined that Tim had acted in self-defense and there would be no charges. After the hubbub died down and the police had finished their questions, Tim arose and left the bar for home. He felt good, not because he had done damage to Hurley, but because he had not lost control and had not killed him as he could have easily done. Perhaps there are times when a little bit of violence is the answer to a problem, he thought to himself in amusement. Additional months slid by and Tim's new company continued to prosper. Tim had made very sure that he hired only the very best people, people with outstanding expertise in the field, and he rewarded them accordingly. He also ensured that all of his clients were treated respectfully, with fairness and always with their best interests in mind. He found that the keys to success in business were not all that complex. Provide excellent services, charge fairly, and do everything practicable to ensure the faithfulness of the client. His credo worked. He now found that he was the head of a very successful business. So why wasn't he happy? Why wasn't he content? He would not, or could not, examine the reason for that discontent. He refused to dwell upon that. A single life, lost love, he never told anyone. I guess he never will. Dear listener, if you have reached this far please click on the subscribe button. It will be a great help.